Good day to our colleagues and guests in Hong Kong and Australia. Welcome to the New South Wales Hong Kong Export Connection for Health Food Business webinar, an initiative of Hong Kong Trade Development Council and New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. In the next 90 minutes, we will cover some new and emerging agricultural health food industry opportunities in Australia, and we'll be welcoming two guest speakers from Hong Kong who will discuss market opportunities for healthy foods in Hong Kong, health food and wellness consumption in business in Hong Kong. We will also hear from a New South Wales company, Gatherby, on their export endeavour and the strategy behind it and the outcomes they have achieved. Our speakers will address questions that have been submitted through their presentation in the following question and answer session. If you have further questions during the presentation, please write them to our chat function on your screen. Should we have too many questions for the Q&A session, we will respond after the webinar. I'll now start a presentation with an overview on the future of food, health food, food for health, and the market of the future. So, I am the lead of international engagement and economic strategy team in the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. That's New South Wales DPI. Established in 1890, New South Wales DPI is Australia's largest supplier of research and development services to primary industries, with a team of 650 scientists and technicians working on over 1,000 active research projects at 25 research sites all over New South Wales. We are globally recognised in the top 1% of research organisations in plant, animal and environmental sciences. Over 130 years, our solutions-focused approach is through strategic, practical and agile research programs, providing tested science to underpin farm decision making and advice on implications to the community and policy makers. Today, our agricultural scientists and the primary industries are facing some greatest challenges of feeding a growing world population while reducing our impact on the environment with an even greater challenge of decreasing the incidence of diet-related chronic diseases. This challenge can only be met by building a more detailed and comprehensive understanding of food through analytics and bringing this knowledge to practice through innovation. The urgency of agri-food success to our survival is becoming more and more mainstream. Questions such as how can we continue to feed and clothe a growing world sustainably? What efficiencies can be made to reduce waste across the food supply chain and promote the circular economy? And how do we ensure the longevity, success, and developing capability of the food and agri sector? New South Wales DPI 2050 initiatives were discussed at our 2020 Spark Forums last October and November, focused on big goals and, a, and that have widespread community and industry interest and commitment. These six goals serve to our purpose of stronger primary industries, which is about how New South Wales DPI can use the disruptions of 2019-20 to create opportunities for transformation and help our industries access new markets, products, customers, and segments by 2050. One of these big goals is food as medicine. So what is health food? Health food is natural food that's thought to have health-giving qualities. Any natural food popularly believed to promote or sustain good health by containing vital nutrients, being grown without the use of pesticides, or having a low sodium or fat content. It is also emphasises fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and fat-free or low-fat milk and milk products. It includes lean meats, poultry, fish, beans, eggs and nuts. It's low in saturated fats, trans fats, cholesterol, sodium and added sugars. And it stays within your daily calorie needs. In 2013, the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating was produced. It's a food selection guide and the primary educational and promotional tool in the Eat for Health program. It converts the scientific knowledge of food composition and nutritional requirements for optimal health and well-being into a practical guide representing the proportion of the five food groups recommended each day. 
The guide does not apply to people with specific medical conditions which require specialised dietary advice, nor the frail elderly who are at risk of malnutrition. The 2013 Australian Dietary Guidelines are going to be reviewed. In 2020, the Australian Government announced it will provide 2.5 million to the National Health and Medical Research Council to review the Australian Dietary Guidelines. The review of the guidelines will ensure that government dietary assistance and advice is based on the best and most recent scientific evidence about the types and amount of food we need to have a healthy and long life. Now, there are a range of different commodities that might be considered to be healthy food. And this short slide lists the new and emerging agricultural industry opportunities. Now, some of these are native foods, but many of them are introduced in the Australian agricultural community, including researchers, is trying to work with these to see how they can be turned into healthy food products for all us all. Of particular note in amongst this list is the flax linseed production, which is um, starting to pick up in Australia, and seaweed production, which offers major hope for the future. We'll be talking a little bit more about these in a moment. Also of note is the edible insects. It's not a category that um, gets immediate buy-in from Australian consumers, but increasingly there is a conversation about how to actually incorporate insect protein into our diets. This particular slide is looking at the wide and diverse health foods um, that Australia possesses. These fresh produces of nuts and vegetables, grains and pulses, dairy, meat, seafood and nuts, and then bush tucker or bush foods, which is the native Australian foods. These have been used by um, Australian Aborigines for over 50,000 years to sustain themselves and keep their health good in what is a very challenging environment. These include the fruits of Guangdong, Kujera, Muntries, Ryeberry, Davidson's Plum and Finger Lime. Native species such as lemon myrtle, mountain pepper and the kakadu plum. Various native yams are valued as foods with warrigal greens, a popular leafy vegetable. And macadamia nut, nut, which many of us are familiar with, the most identifiable bush tucker plant, which is harvested and sold in large scale commercial quantities. Murray cod and Sydney rock oysters are also native foods. The rich Australian flora containing over 25,000 native species provides opportunities for the selection of traditionally consumed sources that, besides being new attractive foods, possess significant health enhancing properties. Now the emerging Australian native food industry has enormous potential for the development and delivery of authentic Australian foods for, the, for both Australian and international communities. Some native crops, including fruits, herbs and spices, have already entered commercial production. Products containing native foods are available in chain supermarkets, in delicatessens and specialty shops. Originally sold as tourist souvenirs, they have also entered and enriched the everyday diets of Australian consumers. In 2009, the Australian Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation, now called AgriFutures Australia, an Australian statutory corporation set up by the Australian government in 1990 to help fund research and development in Australian rural industries, examined 13 native foods that are commercially produced and found evaluated samples displayed superior antioxidant capacity compared to the blueberry um, control. So we all know how healthy blueberries can be. A lot of these products were actually found to be better. So outstanding antioxidant capacities were exhibited by Kakadu Plum and Kwandong, which belong to the same fruit category as the blueberry control. The sources of superior antioxidant capacity among the herbs and spices were Tasmanian pepper leaf, lemon myrtle and anise myrtle. Now, trend two is the sea of the future, so marine permaculture and kelp and seaweed farming. Australia's pristine and isolated coastal environment provides a massive opportunity for the development of seaweeds within Australia. Historically, seaweed has been imported in Australia for use in a range of products. 
However, the real potential in developing new ingredients and alternative uses for seaweed, such as animal feed, fertilizer, pharmaceuticals, and nutraceuticals is just being realized in addition to the numerous health benefits. Australian coastal waters are home to thousands of native seaweed species, many of which show promise in a variety of the aforementioned markets. Of particular note is the native genus of red seaweeds, Asparagopsis species, which when incorporated as an animal feed, reduces methanogenesis in cattle and could revolutionize the world's approach to mitigating livestock emissions. The scale of opportunity in building the entire supply chain from production to processing to consuming seaweed products has the potential to create jobs in regional areas and across value chains, improve the diets and health of Australians and protect Australian ecosystems. In, for Eclonia, New South Wales, there are a number of proposals before New South Wales fisheries for seaweed aquaculture around Eden, Naruma and the Jarvis Bay area in southern New South Wales. Collection of seaweeds is currently the main source of Australian seaweed today, and investment is welcome into the commercial sector. Now, seaweeds have many health benefits and provide food and protein for our growing population. Seaweed is one of the longest known foods for use by human health and in medicine. Archaeological sites from 13,000 years ago in South America demonstrate how the first humans travel over continents with seaweed used to sustain them. Our own Australian first people likely used seaweed for longer than that. Ancient Chinese pharmacopoeia identified certain seaweed that could eliminate gut parasites. And now modern human clinical trials are showing how seaweed can contribute to eliminating some of our chronic modern world in, in, in diseases. There are already a few seaweed product companies in New South Wales, such as Sea Health Products, FICO Health, and MBK for Life. Increasing the production and availability of nutritious food and encouraging more people to eat seaweed regularly for health reasons has enormous um, health benefits for society. Plant-based protein will provide a viable path to meet global demand for protein sustainably. But we see it as an alternative to meat, not a replacement. Sometimes people look at DPI with our strong interest in red meat and our white meat production and say, why are you involved in meat alternatives? Well, it's the giving that option. Some people that don't want meat-based diets have got that option if we can produce meat alternatives. So, a growing body of research predicts that global expenditure on plant-based meats will reach up to 140 billion US dollars by 2029, or 10% of the 1.4 trillion global meat market, from less than 1% currently. Although most estimates have predicted less than $50 billion by the mid-2020s. The range in estimates reflects the emerging nation nature of the sector and highlights the massive opportunity for Australia to become an industry leader during this critical growth phase. Here are two plant-based Australian startup businesses worth watching. Nutri-V, who has a startup based in Victoria, takes 100% Australian grown vegetables and turns them into nutrient dense, fiber rich and protein fueled vegetable powders. The nutrients of vegetables and a convenient powder and imagine getting the benefits of a full serve of vegetables in one small scoop of powder. Imagine being able to eat, add it to any meal, any time. Imagine being able to reduce food waste while helping all Australians improve their health. Plant-based meat startup V2 Food announced on 22nd of October last year the 77 million Australian dollars Series B round, breaking records as the largest funding round in this category within this country. The financing was led by major, major institutional investors, including Liga Shane, Horizons Ventures in, in, the, in Hong Kong, Singapore's sovereign fund Tomasek, and Sequoia Capital from China. V2 Food said the capital will go towards completing its production facility, growing its team, and expanding into new markets, with its main target being Asia.
Before I conclude my presentation, I'd like to mention some of the significant relations that New South Wales and Australia have with Hong Kong. Hong Kong imports a significant amount of Australian food and beverages because consumers appreciate our safe, fresh produce and quality beverages. Hong Kong's location gives Australian companies an important base for commercial engagement with China and neighbouring countries in North and Southeast Asia. With the Australia-Hong Kong Free Trade Agreement and Associated Investment Agreement, when it entered into force on 17th of January 2020, we look forward to continuously working with the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Sydney office, which represents the Hong Kong government in Australia. Bonnie Sheik and your team, we thank you for your working with us. And we look forward to working with you to expand and grow our agri-export into the Hong Kong market and beyond. I'll now, um, I'll now hand over to one of our colleagues, and in this instance, it's going to be Kelvin Horn, who's going to present to us on HKTV Mall, who will give, and he will give an overview and a general insight into health, food, and wellness consumption in Hong Kong. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Kelvin. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me just share my screen so I can present my uh, deck here. Just a moment, sorry. Yep. Hi, everyone. So I uh, just wanted to give you a little background of what HKTV Mall is about. So uh, HKTV Mall has been launched since 2014, and then we have been uh, ranked by YouGov brand index uh, in Hong Kong as a top brand in uh, 2019. And fast forward to uh, 2020, which is last year, uh, in terms of the Google search results, we have uh, been ranked as the second hottest keyword search, just below the first uh, keyword search, which is the Trump and Biden US election in Hong Kong region. So um, we emphasize ourselves as a landlord, uh, e-marketplace, not a retailer that compete with other merchants. So uh, at the moment, we have over 14 product categories um, and we carry over 4,200 partnered merchants at the moment. And we carry over 450,000 skills, which uh, come across uh, all 14 product categories. So uh, in terms of the uh, customer base, uh, we've been growing steadily since uh, 2015. And then in particular of 2019 to 2020, uh, we see there is an increment of over 20%. And we're looking over at a 25 to 30% of increment in the coming year of the statistics about the products that are selling off HATMO at the moment. So throughout 2019 to 2020, we see there is a particular growth in terms of groceries and beauty and health, and also other continuous steady growth in other related product categories. Yep, and um, a lot of people may say that uh, once the COVID is uh, finished, once everyone is back to normal life, then uh, the online consumption may decrease due to the shopping habits. But um, with the statistics that we have found uh, online and uh, through our backend system, we can see that there's a trend that once the customers have developed the online shopping experience habit, then um, it's likely that they will likely to stay on with uh, shopping on e-marketplaces because of how convenient it is. So uh, in terms of the health foods that are sold on HATV Mall at the moment, uh, we see that there are three popular countries of origin. So the first one will be Canada, second one will be Australia, and the third one will be Korea. And in terms of the uh, types of product categories in the health food um, sector, we see that uh, particularly say uh, dry food, cereals, uh, honey in particular, et cetera, that are sold uh, that are sold more particularly well and uh, complied with uh, different combinations of uh, marketing campaigns on HKTV Mall, we can help our merchants to boost the sales and And what HKTV Mall offers to our uh, interested merchants is that an all-in-one e-business solutions, which cover many three factors. So the first one will be the unique e-store. The second one will be about the operation and logistics support. And the third one will be about the marketing. So in terms of the unique e-store, each uh, onboard merchant will get their own uh, store page. 
which uh, we allow merchants to arrange some brand building on the backend system so they can decorate their storefront, upload different product uh, images, uh, descriptions, and decorate their uh, whole interface, etc. And then in terms of the number of products that they can list, uh, it's unlimited. In other words, merchants can upload as many products as they like, and one store page can uh, have multiple product categories, including health foods or groceries, etc. And then our promotions and price control are fully uh, determined by our merchants. In other words, without any intervention. And in terms of the CS, our customers directly, our CS team will handle these inquiries on behalf of our merchants. And in terms of the uh, uh, secure payment gateway, uh, once merchants are on board, they'll be able to use a payment gateway system such as Union Pay, PayPal, Visa, Master, et cetera, right away. And then the two to three percent, the credit card transaction fee is already included in the commission that is going to split between merchant and HATMO. So in other words, uh, merchants are not required to pay an additional of uh, the credit card transaction fee when they have uh, each time when they have a new sales order. And uh, also, we also have some uh, merchant workshop, which allows our merchants to understand how to operate, how to upload their products to HATMO in the long run. In terms of our operations, uh, right now, most of our products are under this logistic workflow called standard delivery. So um, when merchants receive their orders, they will need to pick and pack them and then deliver to our Chetimo warehouse. And then the day after, it will be handled by our logistic teams uh, with uh, more than 350 car lines uh, with our trucks to deliver the products to your customers. So uh, here, it's an infographic of how it works practically. So from Monday to Saturday, merchants uh, will need to be aware of them after 9 a.m. They will need to uh, see how many sales orders there are that are with transaction time before 9 a.m. And then they will need to um, pick and pack these orders and deliver to our HATM warehouse uh, before 6 p.m. accordingly. And uh, in terms of marketing campaigns, uh, we do have some weekly uh, promotions uh, which are showcased in this slide. So on the left-hand side, we have a flash sale Tuesday. And then on the right-hand side, we have VIP day. So uh, basically uh, merchants will need to sign up a Google form and then uh, to provide options. And then once they are selected by our marketing team, they will enjoy these additional exposures on our, our website or our app accordingly. So um, if you have more interested or uh, questions that would like to ask us later on, you can uh, take a picture of this, uh, which is my email and my WhatsApp contact, and we're more than happy to Well, that was great. Thank you. It was very informative and, uh, and helpful. There's some um, excellent insight into what the market looks like, where the opportunities might be, and how to actually get into it. Um, I'd now like to introduce Matt Blomfield, who is the founder and CEO of GatherBuy, to talk about his company and his uh, export experience so far. Hello everybody, thanks very much uh, for joining uh, 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 us here today. I'd like to share um, my screen and presentation um, now as we go. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm Matt Blomfield. I'm founder and chief executive of GatherBuy. Um, GatherBuy is a for-profit social enterprise that has developed a new innovative regenerative Manuka honey farming model. 
we work closely in collaboration with regional communities, including our First Nations people and several Australian universities and produce a high value, pure, raw and potent medicinal and therapeutic honey known as our Gather By Bioactive Plus Australian Manuka. We sell, package and sell our Australian Manuka to the local, national and global market. You'll see on this slide our tagline being community environment healing, which really does connect all of the work that we're doing with the local community to produce this valuable honey, valuing and restoring ecosystems for the environment that offers us this life enhancing product and the healing that we do with the communities and the environment, saving the bees and pollinators as we go along. Community environment healing. We are changing the way honey is produced and marketed in Australia while restoring collapsing ecosystems. In my time with you today, I hope to provide you with insight into the Manuka honey industry, the innovations that are going on in agriculture, and the productization of a medicinal and therapeutic Australian Manuka, and how anyone can be involved. Manuka honey, what is Manuka honey? Leptosper Leptospermum plants are native to Australia that produce a molecule in its nectar called dihydroxyacetone. Once the bees collect the nectar from these Le Australian native Leptospermum plants, which are also known as Manuka and Jellybush, they take that back to their hive and harvest it. That molecule changes to MGO or methyl glyoxal. Now, this Manuka honey is packaged and priced for sale by MGO level, which is measured in milligrams per kilogram and shown on labels around the world as MGO from 100 plus to MGO 1000 plus, indicating the strength of the honey. The big question that we have is what's the difference between Australian Manuka versus New Zealand Manuka? And there are five clear points of differentiation in, in this regard. Number one, and perhaps the most important, Australia is the last beekeeping country on earth free of the deadly bee killing mite known as Varroa destructor. Now, New Zealand struggles to deal with Varroa, resorting to the use of miticides and antibiotics for treatment. What Gather By is doing is planting biodiversity in plants to be able to produce a strong disease resistant honeybees. And in Australia, we have 87 varieties of leptospermum trees, which are native to Australia, 15 varieties have extremely high DHA levels. Conversely, in New Zealand, the entire Manuka honey industry is based on one variety of leptospermum, knowing the leptospermum scoparium that they call Manuka, which has relatively low DHA levels to the, uh, to the uh, leptospermum plants grown in Australia. Point three. The industry here is underdeveloped and uncoordinated. It's a cottage industry based on traditional beekeeping practices. Now, conversely, New Zealand has built a $600 million industry over the years, confirming, confirming global demand and the health benefits of this valuable honey. This creates significant opportunity for farmers and growers along the east coast of Australia. In Australia, we have biodiversity and flowering periods of these leptospermum plants or manuka plants between four and six months, producing a raw, pure and potent honey. Conversely, New Zealand grow in monoculture um, plants with this single species, four to six weeks of 
um, flowering and they stabilize and process their, their honey by creaming it. Point five, all gathered by uh, honey, manuka honey produced is securely tracked and traced from apiary site to the consumer. Whereas in New Zealand, approximately 10 times more New Zealand manuka honey is sold than is produced due to acts of substitution and dilution. All right, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's get going here. Five years of R&D that we've been involved in has led to what we say is the world's first closed loop regenerative farming model, sustainably producing therapeutic and medicinal honey. This is based on the five years of research and we've licensed multiple nurseries in different bioregions to be able to produce these plants. What we've done is rather than set up large monoculture plants ourselves out, uh, out west, we've engaged the community, the farmers and the growers. We've engaged our First Nations people and we're planting all the way along the east coast of Australia. We do the beekeeping, the storage, the packing and the distribution, which means that our entire supply chain is secured from the propagation of the plant and the identification of the plants through to the, 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 the harvesting through the bees and the packaging into the shelves around the world as our world premium product. Now, what makes this honey so valuable and important? You know, what makes it a $30 jar or a $100 jar or even a $1,000 jar. So at the lower end, MGO 100 and 250 is primarily used for gut health and general wellness I'm taken on a daily basis. It's a daily dose of goodness. At the higher levels, the medicinal levels, it's used for therapeutic use. That's MGO 500 to 1,000. So how that's created is the high DHA plants that we grow with health, using healthy bees, healthy ecosystems, with gentle extractions, preserving all the beneficial enzymes, we're able to produce this pure, raw and potent honey that is used for all kinds of things, including you know, testing up to 80 different pathogenic bacteria, including the MRSA superbug, golden star. So the big problem around here, because it's only produced in New Zealand and Australia, is the supply. How do you get your high MGO honey? Well, you can't. You've got to rely on, the, on the, the goodness of Mother Nature and being in the middle of climate change now. Um, we cannot rely on that anymore. So what we've worked out is a model of growing which uh, is called the medicinal honey forest. It's a biodiverse planting of high DHA Australian native leptospermum together with bee fodder plants. Now this is important because what it does, it keeps the bees in situ, in position, rather than trucking bees for hundreds or thousands of kilometers to chase the honey flow. That leads to weakened immune systems. It leads to colony collapse. We're able to work with our community growers to farm honey from diverse ecosystems. Now, when you design a company from the ground up that is based on fundamental principles of value and, and respect and uh, our importance for, to connect with our First Nations people, we're actually changing the way honey is being produced and the flow on benefits to the stakeholders are tremendous. We are replanting on cleared land. We're improving biodiversity and bee health. We're capturing CO2 emissions. We're using innovation and technology for remote hive monitoring, monitoring bee health, honey volumes. We have end-to-end -end track and trace security. We're creating rural jobs for youth First Nations people and farmers in a new natural capital business model. The team that is delivering this is important. We have a sophisticated shareholder base. 
the shareholders value the triple bottom line natural capital business model of Gathervine. We have experienced directors building stakeholder value in the company in this new sustainable honey foam model. And we have an absolute stellar senior leadership team delivering on our long-term target of production of 2,000 tonnes per annum with 250 growers over the next five to eight years. What that will do, everybody, is build a whole new industry here in Australia, a whole new industry that's not, that is, is, is creating jobs, value and growth to regional community. Our facility is established in Ballina, right next to the airport. People can fly in for 40, 50, 60 dollars from Sydney and, and walk to our facility. We are fully accredited and certified for expert, meaning that we have EU certification. We're HACCP, Big Fall and Halal compliant. We are founding members of the Australian Manuka Honey Association, where we're protecting the valuable brand of Australian Manuka and the superiority of the honey over New Zealand Manuka. And we're exporting to more than six countries with repeat orders, increasing demand. These countries are valuing the honey, not by how much money we spend on marketing or not by how much you know, by, by doing the same thing over and over. They're, they're taking this on because of the quality of the product that we are delivering. So what are, what are we delivering? We have trademarked our name, Gather by Bioactive Plus Australian Manuka. We're delivering that in jars in all sizes, from 125 gram to 500 gram in all NGO levels. We have new compostable sessions for sport, health and travel when on the go. We are partnering with the global community on joint branding. And if somebody has an equal quality of brand that gather by, we're putting their little brand on us and our little brand on there. And we're now starting to develop a whole new medicinal and therapeutic products coming online based on the high NGO that we are producing and acquiring from our beekeepers. We're looking for collaborators, people and partners who we want to work with for the long term. Distribution channels via valuing Gather Buys World Premium brand strategic partners for co-branding into deep niche markets, sophisticated investors seeking high returns from equity shareholding, and we're seeking more growers seeking diversified income with contracted high returns. You can see how you can contact uh, us for further details and our names are on the, uh, on the list later on. What I'd like to do though is now uh, uh, end my uh, uh, presentation with a short video, which is an acknowledgement of the uh, the beekeepers that we uh, we work with, the importance of them in uh, in how we um, uh, in, in our uh, in our life. Go back to here. Stop screen share. I trust we can all see that.
Foundation, um, where we're hoping to produce some great honey and add some, bring some value out of the, 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 the what the land already has in the area, which if, if it's not tapped into, um, you know, the production of these honeys is, is something that can give people jobs and give people security and yep. it allows to repopulate the areas with bees and beekeepers. It's one of the things about um, the bees is, is in most of the world now and probably soon here is, it's sad to say, but the bees don't really survive without the beekeepers. So we're sort of becoming tied in. And for an area to have good bees, you need the area to have good beekeepers. And for a beekeeper to be viable, you need to be able to, you know, make a living and be profitable and and create a product that has a great value to it, and not, not just a monetary value, but an intrinsically good product, um, which has health values and is great for everyone involved in the process, really. And that allows us to be key, and it also allows the land to be looked after. So, for example, if you see the, the ranges over there, and if they can get some work being involved in the project, and some of the local indigenous can um, get work helping to uh, change the balance of the plants and regenerate and restore the land, and that's going to be a great thing. And, and I think the beauty of if they do it on their terms with Gather By, then they get to control how much of it's done in a traditional way and how to bring that into a modern setting. And I think that's where the beauty of it comes through. And by using it to local people, um, challenges organisation, I think they'll be able to let people for once decide what's good for people, take, take a bit of the ownership, um, the profitability and that, that responsibility um, of looking after the land level where it's um, sustainable, it's profitable, it's enjoyable, and it's creating something positive for everyone. Thank you, Matt, for that uh, presentation. It was a very comprehensive and clear explanation that uh, not all Manuka honey is the same, but also uh, an admirable overview of the way that you are bringing us... ...with up to 120,000 bonus quant points. But you're bringing us a, a new way of looking at business, which works with community, the environment and um, economy to try and produce a, a sustainable business model for the future. So thank you for that. Um, I'd now like to um, shift our focus to Mr Eugene Hall um, to provide uh, an overview of Jiangsu Hong Kong Business Hub. Um, he's going to talk about the company and also export to Hong Kong through traditional channels. So over to you, Eugene. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. I'll uh, share my screen now. Hi, everyone in Australia. I'm Eugene and I'm the CEO of uh, Jiangsu Hong Kong Business Hub. So maybe, you know, some people have the questions, why do we have the word Jiangsu? It's because we are the sole agent for a large uh, state enterprise in China, which is the Jiangsu Salt Corporation. Jiangsu Salt is actually the main uh, tax earner for the Chinese government for the last 3000 years. We have been the main salt in China. And we and my company is the sole agent for them in Hong Kong and Macau. And we also help them with Asian countries. Um, last year, we, all, we were also awarded the sole agency of another company in China, which is packaged hot pot sauce. And uh, the, the business is ticking off. And from this year, we're looking into health foods. So um, let's just start with some, you know, sharing some facts for you guys. Let's go straight to it. First of all, thank you on Hong Kong Trade Development Council and uh, New South Wales DPI. Thank you very much. Topic one, the facts and trends that I think most, some of the registrants like to know. Um, in Hong Kong, 
this is a, uh, a very established survey by one of the largest consulting companies, not by our company. 58% of Hong Kong citizens have the habits of consuming health products. In the last six months, on average, that's 65, uh, $650 per person per month. And the, it's, the trend is increasing every year. Compared to this, the same survey done by the same company uh, in 2014, the, in, the increase is actually more than 32%. Um, I think the steep curve occurred since the year before. And now it's, it's actually the pace is getting you know, faster. The range of choices, the these are the top ones, vitamins and minerals, omega oils, of course, and the uh, Western herbs and plant extracts. We actually, we see that probiotics and fiber are, get, are getting the, main, the most speed. And they, you know, they are, they are, they are, they're going to get ahead of Western herbs very soon. That's what we see. And also bone joints and protection. Of course, immunity boosting products. It's also uh, doing much faster in cells uh, compared to vitamins and minerals and omega oils. So when we divide by groups, you know, the spending, green foods, supplements, that's the figure, $450, Hong Kong dollars per month. Ingestible skin diet, you know, diet including the diet pills for ladies, and Chinese supplements. Actually, it's surprisingly, it's less than those two, you know, what we consider Western groups. It's actually um, Chinese supplement is not doing that great comparing to the fast pace of the other two main groups. So the total annual spending of Hong Kong people on health foods in general, it's 4 billion uh, Australian dollars. But we see, we, we, we see that it's gonna hit at least 4.5 or 4.6 billion dollars uh, this year. So maybe some of the uh, Australian friends here are not familiar with the uh, Hong Kong environment. Um, with the, um, with the, uh, can you please, with the group one, it's actually the um, high end pharmacies, which is, there are only two big brands in Hong Kong. One is Mennings. They're owned by the Hong Kong Dairy Farm, which was owned by the um, British uh, conglomerate, Jardine's Group. The second one is A.S. Watson's, owned by the famous uh, billionaire Lee ka -Sheng. The A.S. Watson Group, it's connected to the park and shop superstore. But when you deal with them, you don't deal with them together. You deal with them separately. And the Mannings, uh, Pharmacy is connected to the Welcome brand superstore. And also you deal with them separately. And uh, most of the health brands from foreign countries, they will uh, like to go to Mannings or AX Watson's first because that's the you know, best launch pad. And of course, Hong Kong TV Mall, our very close strategic partner to, but Mannings and A.S. Watson's let people, you know, they can feel and touch. And they're actually promoters in store that can introduce the, uh, 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 your products. But then we'll have a slide highlighting the costs, implications of these different outlets. And it, most importantly, um, group three is actually the uh, traditional dispensaries or the uh, local pharmacies you see here. Why do I say it's pretty important? Because um, uh, they are always around us. They are the neighborhood stores. As you can see from the photos, they don't actually sell, only sell drugs. They sell all kinds of supermarket stuff. So it's actually, it still have, you know, they do have a huge impact on how the people spend in particular neighborhoods. They still work very well as sales channels. But in terms of foreign high-end health um, 
health foods, it might be not the best place to launch first. Okay, this is a slide that we can share with you guys, you know, after the seminar, if you find it um, useful. Some of the figures are, you know, just for reference. I'll start from over the, on the left, Hong Kong TV Mall, our closest partner. Actually, they are number one, uh, the online platform in Hong Kong. And the number two is not even close. That's the um, annual fee. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kelvin, uh, after the seminar. And for health foods, it's around this range, 20%, you know, 24% of your uh, retail price. And of course, they have optional, you know, logistics plans. And we also listed out the pros and cons, and you can read them later. I, I will point out some of the high, you know, highlight some of the stuff. First of all, we think that Hong Kong TV Mall, the initial investment is very fair. And um, the cons, number one is, it has, as you can see, what, 4,000 merchants. So you must advertise to stand out. Mannings and the other A.S. Watson's high-end pharmacies, they charge you per SKU per shop, but it's one off. So you think, oh, one off is not that much. But if yourself, your sales revenue doesn't live up to their expectations, they kick you out. And when you want to come back, you have to pay this again. The commission is 40% and they have the uh, authority to set your prices. And uh, you, of course, with all the channels, you have to worry about the logistics costs, which is quite high in Hong Kong. As you guys know, Hong Kong has one of the highest rents in Hong Kong in terms of residential or commercial, even warehouse. And with um, the only, you know, uh, relatively cheaper thing is the delivery. But with, when you think about who to package your products, you know, the labeling and all that, it adds up. So with Mannings and A.S. Watson Group, again, it's an ideal place to launch a brand, but the cost is high. Traditional pharmacies, um, if you don't have an importer in Hong Kong, you can't, you can't do it because uh, there are hundreds well, actually thousands of uh, these local pharmacies that can help you. But first of all, the commission is high and you need, they're scattered. So the logistics is a nightmare if you don't have an importer in Hong Kong. But if you do have one, they, the tr traditional pharmacies are based on relationships. Sometimes they don't even charge you one-time fee and it, you know, the commission might not be that high. It depends. Large supermarket tr chains, uh, for, you know, for therapeutic products, we don't think it's the most ideal, uh, 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 you know, initial launch pad. But for, you know, food type of health food, it's good. But the figures, I don't want to repeat, it's written over here. So the last uh, column is ourselves. We, uh, we are actually not only an importer, we are a marketing agent and logistics partner for our brands. So it's all based on the negotiation and the cons, the bad side of dealing with us is we don't buy goods. We help you make sales in Hong Kong. So um, some of the registrants asked the DPI or the TDC before the seminar that what is the best way to connect to distributors in Hong Kong, in China? That's really hard to answer. It's like, if I ask you, how do you connect to distributors in Australia? It's the answers, you know, can be pretty vague. We think the most useful um, first step is to sign up to the B2B sourcing surface of the Hong Kong TDC, because when you talk to Hong Kong partners, they check you out, they check your background over on the Hong Kong TDC platform. So, and the price is reasonable. So we highly recommend you do that first. And then, you know, some people might want to connect to the, um, the pharmacies and the supermarkets directly. Here are the emails. You can give it a try. But for um, middle-sized and small firms, I don't think they will respond at all. So some registrants asked, 
what's the difference between local importer and direct to supermarket? Supermarkets are really too proud to negotiate, except um, expect you talk to them at least for dialogue for a year because they just don't care. They have thousands of friends to work, you know, to work to deal with. Um, they get hundreds of inquiries every day. So you need to go through some relationships. I'm sorry, but you need to do that. We have been selling edible salts and hot pot items through supermarkets for years. So we have the communication channel, but sometimes uh, they just don't return calls. They don't return emails. Um, in the first year back then when we had no promotion budget, surprisingly in supermarkets, actually we had decent sales because people just you know go to supermarkets just like in Australia. But from the second year and on, we poured in a um, uh, promotion budget, which of course is uh, we, you know, calculated and it's very satisfactory. Same with Hong Kong TV mall, same with other channels, you need to promote in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a very packed market with health foods. People are buying more, but there's so many brands fighting for their eyeballs. So you need to do that. You cannot just you know, um, say, I give 50% off to a local importer and you do all the work. It doesn't work that way, not anymore. So um, I think you need some kind of importer or agent or at least a logistics partner. Even with when you work with Hong Kong TV Mall, which I suggest you do, you, you do need your own logistics you know, people on the ground to do the concrete work for you. Um, I think right now in Hong Kong for health food, you cannot just depend on online channel just yet. And if you deal with supermarkets, obviously they just consider their own agenda. And if they know that you don't have other outlets, they will just, you know, increase their commission and you have no say. So this is a very brief background of what we do and, of, and actually the landscape of the China and Hong Kong shopping landscape. The focus is online. Online is the trend, there's no doubt. From um, the left side, we uh, are starting to work with large scale discount website in China, Ping Duo Duo, which is uh, listed on NASDAQ. In, uh, on the direct buying websites, you know, you, we might have not heard about this. These are membership clubs, buying clubs, you know, uh, uh, like Sam's Club in the US. Over here are the big boys, HATV Mall in Hong Kong, number one. In China, is Tmall owned by Alibaba. We work with them, JD.com. Uh, we work with them because some of the brands gave us exclusive rights for China and Hong Kong, which we like to work that way. Hong Kong is um, a bit too small for us. And of course, there are the trend is direct to consumer social media. In Hong Kong, Macau, in, the, in China, people start buying through WeChat store, uh, TikTok, that, you know, pushing items. You know, it's like a sales channel now. And then uh, we work with those. We work with the influencers, the KOL, um, actually, that's also the trend in Hong Kong. The KOL, you know, most of them, young housewives, they're making a lot of money pushing products, and we work with them. So um, my PBT is actually almost done. I think the most important part is the chart where I summarize the costs for different channels, the pros and cons. Topic two is just, you know, our... Uh, our company background, which I'll highlight very quickly. We were um, commissioned by the Jiangsu, um, actually the Jiangsu government. The Jiangsu province is the, is the province which has the cities Nanjing and Suzhou to push uh, salts for them, even industrial salts. And one of the major salts we have actually is produced in Australia, in Western Australia, in Uses Loop. So we do have experience working with Australia. That's the, our salt field in useless loop. So um, this is our surface. Uh, if any of the health, uh, health food friends here today really are interested, you can drop us an email, see if we can help. 
Um, last, this is the last screen. Why do you need to go through Hong Kong? Because you know everyone knows that you know China is has tempers, and mainland China. I mean, so today they may ban wine, lobsters, you know, wood, coal. Tomorrow, who knows? China is their you know prodigal son. We're always free to do what we want. So I think okay. even for Asia countries, it's best to use Hong Kong as your main outpost. And yeah, and that's it. This is our contact. And thank you very much. Thank you. Eugene, that was great. Thank you for a very comprehensive and honest overview of how to deal with the retail landscape in Hong Kong. It was very, um, I uh, appreciated the way that you put that. It was very clear. It looks like um, your supermarkets are as hard to deal with as, as ours as well, uh, something we very much share. I'd now like to introduce uh, Wani Sheikh from uh, HKTDC Australia to talk a little bit about um, HKTDC and its actions and maybe make some closing remarks. Thank you, Bonnie. Over to you. Hi everyone. Um, let me. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, just now, Eugene has. Um, let me double check. Just now, Eugene has um, talked about the Hong Kong market. So in my presentation, um, I will go through the, um, uh, uh, provide some highlights on the uh, China health food market. Um, and then I'll talk about the services that we provide um, and how we can help uh, Australian businesses to expand into Hong Kong, China and wider Asia. Um, our research team recently uh, has completed a report on the China health food market. And there are some key findings. Um, the total sales of health food in China uh, back in 2019 amount to 44 billion Australian dollars. Um, and it is an increase of 18.5% compared to the year before. Um, according to the forecast, this year, the total sales will increase to 65 billion uh, Australian dollars. So year on year double digit growth. And when we look at the per capita consumption is relatively low um, compared to some of the mature markets. Like um, in the US, the per capita uh, consumption of health food was over $180 uh, back in 2018. In Japan, uh, 132, but in China, only 23. So as you can see, there's a I mean, huge room uh, for growth. When we look at the market segmentation uh, of the health food, uh, we identify that the uh, segment with a huge potential is the elderly or what we call the silver market. Estimated that 70% of those aged 65 and above consume health food and include um, healthy products that nourish um, or have specific health benefits like uh, helping you to sleep or digestion or nourishing, nourishing um, uh, the liver, the heart. So the elderly have been, I mean, regularly consuming the um, health food products. And how big is the market? Um, at the end of um, 2019, about 18% of the population in China um, are aged 60 and above, and that equates to a market size of 254 million. Um, according to the forecast by 2050, um, the, those age 65 and above in China will account for 30% of the population. And not only that, 
the life expectancy is also increasing. Um, the average life expect, ex, uh, expectancy uh, will increase from 76 to almost 82 years uh, by 2040. So that means the, uh, as the people are, uh, I mean, uh, uh, growing older, they are also living longer and there are more and more of them are consuming health food. Um, the other segment that has got good potential is the maternal and health, baby health food. Uh, estimated that 95% um, of pregnant women, um, they took uh, health food products during the pregnancy. Now, if you're interested, if you want to, um, to, have, uh, to have a look at the full report, please go on to our research website. Now, Hong Kong has always been a major trading hub uh, within Asia, uh, international financial center, and a gateway to China. The role is evolving. The latest development is in the Greater Bay Area, which is a city cluster of 11 cities, including Hong Kong and Macau in the southern part of China. There is a population of 71 million and a GDP of 1.7 trillion US dollars, which is bigger than that of Australia. Um, Macau alone import um, 2 billion Australian dollars of F&B products every year. And the buying offices are actually in Hong Kong. Many of the products are repacked and transshipped through Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is always, has always been had that role as a hub. Um, the cross-border e-commerce um, has been increasing, growing rapidly. Um, last year, in the first five months, the cross-border e-commerce imports into China actually increased by 23%. And in the Greater Bay Area, um, the forecast is it will continue to grow rapidly. And Hong Kong has got very strong logistics system services. Um, to get imported products into the Greater Bay Area. And some overseas companies also prefer to do, to have their, um, do their warehousing in Hong Kong and only ship out to the, uh, to the customers when they receive the orders and then clear the customs there. So it gives them um, fle greater flexibility and also uh, enhance the efficiency. Um, the other way that Hong Kong companies can add value is through the formulating the marketing strategy, whether it's online, offline, and other uh, publicity channels as well. And Ian mentioned about the Australia Hong Kong FTA, which is described as a modern FTA, uh, aiming to remove um, non tariff barriers. In actual fact, within the FTA, there are provisions to facilitate e-commerce and some of the non-tariff barriers like um, the labeling um, and also the uh, collaboration between the, uh, I mean, between the regulators have also been enhanced. So it really helps, I mean, if there are issues, they will be resolved quickly. Um, HHDC is a statutory body that has been established for over um, 55 years. Um, uh, the Sydney office has been helping Australian businesses to sell and to source, connecting them with agent, distributor, business partners and investors um, in Hong Kong. We are a global um, network with 50 offices all around the world. A range of services is offered and we are best known for our international trade fairs and events. Some of those are the largest of its kind in the world. Last year, many of the international events have to be canceled or rescheduled. And we swiftly shifted online, organizing virtual exhibitions and online conferences. The results have been very encouraging. Here's a snapshot comparing the two major uh, virtual exhibitions that we organize. Um, the second one, which is the Optum Sourcing Week Online held in November, we almost dub doubled the number of exhibitors and we also doubled the number of buyers. 
Between the two events, a total of 14,000 one-on-one meetings were conducted. And we, right now we are um, working on the international sourcing show. Um, my office has been busy connecting Australian uh, companies with um, the buyers, suppliers, um, and there is a physical show that is uh, planned for July, covering the following industries on the slide. Last year, we also revamped our online marketplace um, that is backed by an extensive database with over 130,000 quality suppliers and over 2 million global buyers. Now, those buyers are from different parts of the world, not only Hong Kong, China, um, but also from Asia, Europe, North America, Latin America, Middle East, Africa. So it's a great platform for Australian businesses to reach out to the uh, global buyers. And when we, we ramp our marketplace, we also apply the latest AI and machine learning technology to make it easy for the buyers to source but also for suppliers to set up the online store and using um, some of the big data to do the analysis, helping them to, I mean, to do more. We are a trusted uh, online marketplace um, and we work closely with many of the government agencies. Uh, right now, my office is looking at uh, as putting together an Australian pavilion, a food pavilion on the marketplace so that the exporters here can connect with the buyers and getting ready for the economic recovery in different parts of the world. The package is very affordable, it's very good value. Um, the basic package starts at 440 US dollars per company. Now, I won't have time to go through the details, but if you're interested, please contact uh, my office. And in the second half of the year, the physical shows are being planned. And with the food expo, it's scheduled from the 12th to the 16th of August. And um, the, it's always a, I mean, a food extravaganza, very popular event. And the New South Wales Pavilion, curiously, attracted a lot of international buyers. With that, I thank you all for participating. Um, and I, I mean, look forward to um, a further discussion with uh, some of you. Thank you. Bonnie, thanks once again for sharing your extensive knowledge of um, your market, but also what JHK TDC does. Um, your understanding of, of the role and so on of, of HK TDC promoting trade is just brilliant. It's 10 years now since I was in the Hong Kong Convention Exhibition Centre at uh, one of the food expos and, and never seen anything quite so well organised and um, smoothly run. So my compliments to you and your team for the way that you operate, both in Hong Kong, but also here in Sydney. Um, now we're going to go to a question and answer session and uh, I'd like to thank Eugene ahead of time because he's, he's taken a couple of these and answered it already. So thanks for saving us that time, Eugene. But firstly, question one, uh, if we can have that one on the slide. You'll see it, and I'd like this one to um, go to Matt, please. Thanks, Ian. Uh, this is a big question. It's something that I've uh, thought about a, a lot, um, if, if it is particularly impactful. And how we see it as being a, you know, a real problem or an opportunity. So COVID-19 has made, in, in, in my area, everyone aware that their actions are direct, that the actions directly influence their health. Yeah. Notwithstanding that, humans have been facing increasing levels of bacteria and viral infections for generations and generations, and we're going to have more after COVID. Right now, there's increasing levels of interest in health and issues and health scientists that I think should go well into the future. And people are being educated to build immunity, you know, health food, and you know, and Australian manuka could be part of that, and is certainly in high demand in these times. And there's an understanding that food can be nutritious and medicine keeping us healthy and well, and that new sustainable business models are emerging, really focusing on preventative health over treating symptoms. 
So health food businesses and producers uh, have a concern on provenance, knowing where the food comes from. So getting independent accreditation while building value in all aspects of the, the production is what's being, what is going on. And there's an increasing interest in buying local health food products, which will also grow the honey market. Now, these new changes are good and we can build on these for our new times ahead. Question two, Bonnie, I'm going to ask you to help us with that one, if that's okay. Sure. Um, now, yeah, um, there has been quite a bit of uh, trade tension. Um, now, um, it does not impact uh, on the Australian food exports to Hong Kong at all, not at all. Uh, Hong Kong is a special administrative region and is a freight port. Um, so, in actual fact, um, the last, um, in actual, I mean, during the Chinese New Year, it has been reported in the media that um, there has been high demand for Australian uh, uh, products, especially uh, like lobsters, Tasmanian cherries, selling very well. I'm sure I, I see Eugene keep nodding. I think you probably, I mean, have consumed quite a bit of uh, the uh, lobsters and the, uh, the Tasmanian cherries. So, um, and Australian wine also has been reported as increased the um, uh, uh, increased um, in Hong Kong in the last three months um, last year. So um, it does not impact um, the the trade tension does not have any impact on the Australian food product exports to Hong Kong. Having said that, last year what caused the major impact is the um, is COVID. Um, and impact on the logistic, it presents a lot of logistic challenges. So uh, for the food products to get into Hong Kong, but I think now it has kind of, um, it's kind of get back to the to normal now. Okay, that's great, Bonnie, that's reassuring stuff. Thank you. Um, Kelvin, would you like to have a look at the next question, please? Yep, absolutely. So uh, basically, the Hong Kong population have been uh, buying more health food uh, throughout the last year due to COVID. And the main uh, contributor should be the uh, incentive of having uh, a responsibility to improve their uh, immunity system for their loved ones and families, etc. And then in particular, retrieving uh, the data on HAT more uh, as of today, we see the uh, dry fruits, uh, omega oil and honey are selling particularly well. And in particular of honey, uh, we see that there is an incre increment of over 10% of sales uh, throughout the last year. Okay, okay thank you. Um, next question. Bonnie, this looks like one for you. Um, I would say that um, one of the most common challenges um, uh, in the Hong Kong market is um, competition. Um, the, because Hong Kong is a free port, so we import um, F&B products from over 160 countries all around the world. So there are many products available. Uh, to a certain extent, I always say that Hong Kong consumers, they are spoiled. They have got so many choices. Um, so in order to overcome it, it's very important that you differentiate the products. So there has to be a, a differentiation and um, it can be um, uh, to the, I mean, through the branding. I mean, of course the products have, be, have, have to be good, uh, high quality products, but through branding and also um, uh, through um, the uh, marketing um, and also packaging, uh, the innovative creative packaging can make your products stand out. With the marketing, um, I have to um, um, say that now it's getting um, a, a bit more complicated. It's not just being, I mean, having the, putting an ad. Now you really need to have a holistic uh, online and offline uh, marketing strategy uh, to think of the different, different uh, channels. Social media marketing is very popular now. Um, so you, you need to work with a partner to understand um, the local market and be able to provide some market insights. 
Um, so to overcome um, some of the challenges, you need to I mean, find a, I mean, work with your, the agent or distributor or the business partner in Hong Kong in order to uh, help you to understand those issues or the way, where the opportunities are. And then, and then um, I mean, being able to then, um, I mean, make sure that your products have got that unique uh, uh, selling point and be able to, I mean, appeal to the consumers. Next one, Kelvin, is for you, and that's um, you can see it there. How do you become an HKTV more merchant? It looks like I've <laughs> set everything by asking the question. We might go to the next one and see if we can get Kelvin back. Um, so the next question is. Um, to you, um, Matt, you're the best man Manuka money man I know. So how about that one? No, well, it's a very, very important um, question, this. And, and for me, my background is in information security. And my last real job was CEO of a publicly listed company and uh, involved in information security and high value and securing high value assets and uh, working with the FBI and Secret Service. So for me, from the ground up, we took all steps possible to protect the superior gather by Australian Manuka brand, even prior to commercialization. So right from the start, the plants that we spent five years testing for the, 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 you know, the, the nectar and suitability to go to the ground are all coded. They're produced by certified nurseries. Every plant that goes into the ground is, is geocoded. They're grown with community along the east coast of Australia. So we're creating biosecure sites. All of our honey is thoroughly tested and validated by independent laboratories regularly through the supply chain. And all honey is tracked and traced through all production stages from the apiary to the consumer. Um, all honey products are individually coded to guarantee authentic contents for the consumer. We are founding members of the Australian Manuka Honey Association to continue protecting the valuable Australian Manuka brand. Our honey processes are regulated by independent bodies, HACCP, BQOL, Halal, and we're leading research partners with the CRC, we collaborate with Collaborative Research Center, University of WA, and we're working on plant genetics and honey traceability. So we are differentiating the Australian Manuka from the New Zealand Manuka based on the different industry standards of the production and the quality of the honey. All the way through the supply chain, the whole supply chain is completely protected and secured. Thank you, Matt. Um, Kelvin, welcome back. We might go back to your question, if that's okay. Sure. Sorry about it. Uh, my internet just got disconnected. So uh, basically, uh, we also offer some uh, warehouse uh, referrals or some fulfillment uh, solutions for our merchants uh, who do not have any facilities in Hong Kong at the moment, but are interested to enter the Hong Kong market. So they will be able to help you to fulfill the HTMO requirements in terms of the logistics uh, upon receiving the orders from the customers. Now you'll see on the screen now uh, for all participants, there is a quick poll there, which uh, would be appreciated if you can give your answers. So how do you rate it? Basically, would you like to receive information on future webinars we might run? And the third one, um, would you like to connect with any of the companies that you've heard from today or indeed HKTDC or New South Wales DPI? So if you'd like to quickly do that, that would be excellent. Um, we are coming to the end of our time together. So let me just conclude with saying that I want to thank the Hong Kong Trade Development Council team for your partnership in hosting the two Export Connection educational webinars we've had. Uh, today's on health food and the previous one we ran on seafood, which is three weeks ago. Thanks also to our three speakers um, for generously sharing your market and industry expertise with us. Um, 
And to all of you, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy days to join us to explore the export opportunities for health foods. So please um, complete that poll and we look forward to catching up with you at some time in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye.